My name is Michael, and I'm one of the pastors here at Cornerstone Church. I just want to say that I'm so glad you've chosen to be with us this morning, or whenever you're watching this. I feel so blessed that we get to gather together and worship, even if it's not physically. And I want to encourage you that even though we're in this time of isolation, it doesn't mean you're alone. As a church, our vision statement is this, that we are a community of disciples who passionately seek, obey, and reflect Jesus. And although we can't gather together in person right now, I pray that we are still growing as disciples, that we're still learning to seek after Jesus, to learn how to obey what he's telling us to do, and how we can share the love of Jesus with those we encounter, even if it's from a distance. And as a church, we want you to know that we want to stay connected. We want you to know that we are here for you, that we're praying for you, that we care about you. And if you have anything you need from us, if we can meet physical or practical needs, if we can just pray for you, let us know. Because although we can't gather together physically, we can still be in community. So please email us or phone us, message us on Facebook or connect with us on our website. We would love to hear from you. We're now going to head into a time of worship and sharing. Won't you join us? It's a kid's moment. Hi everyone, my name is Bob Dick and this is my lovely wife Wilma and uh, here we are, we're at home right now, we're kind of hunkered down and uh, just taking it easy this afternoon and drinking our coffee and uh, we were asked the question, how has Cornerstone Church helped us to, to grow in our, our spiritual lives and uh, that's a great thing to think about. I think for me, um, I'll just start. Is that okay? Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> I think for me, we've been there about two years. And before that, for several years uh, with my job, I was traveling around doing relief work and uh, never really getting grounded in a church during that time. It was kind of like a, like a, a, a desert. And, and coming to Cornerstone, uh, we quickly realized that uh, people were really reaching out and and you just can't sit back and, and uh, expect things to happen. But uh, we started to get involved in a few groups, like a small, a small group, a weekly group, and get to know people. And we soon came to realize that, that people really want to reach out to, to the community in this church. And uh, 
And that's been a big part of our growth as being encouraged, encouraged to do that. I think we felt right from the very first time we came, <clears throat> we felt very loved and um, appreciated. Um, uh, and that was certainly something that that spoke to us very, very clearly. And we appreciated people who came and talked to us, even though we were strangers, and uh, also people who invited us into their homes. And, and uh, we went home um, a few weeks after starting to, coming to, um, to Cornerstone, and we, we said, you know, people actually even want to be friends. Like, and that was wonderful, and it really drew us in. And, um, and then also as we looked around each Sunday morning, we could see it, there's a, a wide range of um, uh, uh, generations and right from newborn right up until elderly. And uh, we really value that. And um, not only that the generations are all in church, but that they, there are uh, real efforts to, to cross divides and to uh, get to know each other in different generations. And we know how difficult that is sometimes. One of the things that uh, I've been really encouraged by, by the excellent preaching there, thanks Rick, uh, thanks Len, thanks Austin, and, and anyone else that's been preaching, is, is uh, being a Christian just isn't going to Cornerstone and going to church, but uh, learning how to get outside of your comfort zone. And, and we've just recently retired and, and uh, be so easy just to you know sit, sit back and sit at home like we are right now, but uh, to, um, to do that and, and go to church, but uh, I've really been challenged to to get out of my my nice little retirement bubble and get into the community, and uh, that's been accomplished through uh, things like CAP and thanks to Lisa and uh, getting me out and, and seeing what and both of us are, are into that and uh, seeing what what's happening in the world and how people desperately need to come to know Christ and but people are struggling they're struggling in so many different ways and uh, that's been great. Also, we've been involved with. Um, this has really been stretching me in our own neighborhood uh, is, is the love bus. And, and uh, it's not easy to, to go and be part of the love bus. It's totally um, an alien thing for me to, to be there and, and, and just learning so much from folks that are so desperately needy. And, and uh, it's been a real blessing and, and a time of growing for me to, to be a part of that and, and just a real privilege. I think one other thing I'd like to add, uh, Bob saying that he has appreciated the preaching and I, I also feel the same way. Um, but I have also especially appreciated when uh, Lisa and Dawn have preached and, as women. And I think that is very important uh, for the church and for our young people to be a part of. And, um, and so we really appreciate that as well. Yeah, thank you, Cornerstone. Um, we're always growing. We, we've never reached a place where we think we've arrived. And uh, thank you for challenging us. And it's just wonderful to be, uh, to know Jesus as your savior and, and to attend Cornerstone and to be, to be uh, encouraged to grow. Thank you very much. Hey church, today is Palm Sunday and it marks the entry into Passion Week. And if you've missed being together as a church family up to now, this week may feel hard. Uh, as Christians, we tend to have a reputation for maybe being a little bit boring. And admittedly, a lot of North American Christians tend to get more excited about their professional sports teams than they do about Jesus. Uh, there were certainly more sighs and curses when their seasons got cancelled than when church got cancelled, I think. But regardless, this morning we get to do some cheering and shouting. And if you have palm branches, wave them in the air. And anytime I say Hosanna, you can shout out Hosanna just as loud or louder than you think the crowd did that day. Because Jesus is coming into Jerusalem. Matthew 21, 6 through 9 tells the story this way. When they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their coats over it, he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread branches that they cut from the fields. Those who went ahead and those who followed shouted, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. It's kind of easy for us to 
picture that, right? We, we've seen the flannel graphs, we've seen pictures, we've even seen movies that show us. Some of us have got great imaginations and we can even see ourselves standing there with all the people around us as we watch Jesus getting closer and closer and, and closer. I, we, we, we hear the crowd, we hear Hosanna getting louder and louder, and we, we see people taking off their coats and, and, and throwing them on the pathway, making a, a royal carpet for the king, our king, riding on a donkey. Now, all of us had to go to synagogue school, so we know this story. And we all live in a country that's occupied by those stinking Roman pigs, so we all know this story. This is what the prophet Zechariah said. He said, Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey on a colt, the foal of a donkey. This is that story. This is that day. Here comes Jesus, and he's, he's going to be our king, and he's, he's even re, you know, he's riding the donkey. So, of, of course, we're all shouting and yelling and palm branches waving all around me and the noise is tremendous. And, and are you shouting and, and waving your palm branch? See, the king is coming. He's right past us now. He's, he's right here and he's into Jerusalem and he's coming to rule. And if I stand up on my tippy toes, I can see him through the crowd. And, wow, he, he just looked right at me. I mean, like, meaningful eye contact. He looked at me, maybe right through me. And he did that little beckoning hand thing. I could almost hear him say, come on, move right in here beside me and follow me. Wow. That ever happened to you? You see, it's, it's easy to get excited at a parade celebrating some great achievement. The Raptors won, uh, an astronaut walked on the moon, the victorious legions returned to Rome. Parades, pomp, music, floats. So exciting. And even if you don't believe in Jesus, you can get caught up with that Palm Sunday cheering and shouting, the, the Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Standing along the parade route doesn't cost us anything. And somehow we sense that if no one else cheered, no one else shouted, the very rocks underneath our feet would break forth and proclaim that Jesus is King. But that invitation to join him, despite the praises being called out and the festivities along the route, there's something about his eyes that makes me at least want to hang back. See, I think he's calling me to more than just celebrating with him in a parade, more than joining him in a victory lap. He's calling me to follow, and, and right now, it all looks really good. But we know where this story goes to. So consider my life, folks, as I, I think about who I am and who I'm becoming. I confess the temptation to hang back, to stay with the crowd at the side of the road, to be just one of the masses. Not to get too close to this king or any other king, because kings, while they're wonderful and we like to cheer and sing about, they're quite another matter to live with. In Fiddler on the Roof, the, uh, the rabbi gets called on at every occasion and for every purpose to have a blessing. And at some point, someone asks, is there a blessing even for the czar, author of all their troubles? And the rabbi says, may the Lord bless and keep the czar far from us. Tsars, <laughs> kings, rulers are fine when they stay out of our daily lives. But this Jesus, this King Jesus, has no intention of staying out of our daily lives. And he comes to Saskatoon, just like he comes to every other city and town, to each home, asking us to come and follow him. That can be a hard choice to make and a harder one sometimes to keep. And it leads to, to a subtle pattern of self-deception and rebellion. It was there in that first Palm Sunday. It's a rebellion that's under the guise of religious practice. It's playing church 
instead of living life with Jesus. And frankly, that, that's why we sometimes find Christianity boring. We, we serve a tame God who looks and sounds like us. In the years following the, the possession of the promised land, Israel began to long to be like all the other nations. Uh, they wanted gods like the other nations. And then there was that moment when they wanted a king just like the other nations. Israel kind of was like that kid at school whose mom dressed him funny. What he really wanted was to put on running shoes, a t-shirt, and jeans, and just fit in. Instead, Yahweh, the Lord God of Israel, is still directing their steps through the prophet Samuel. And they've learned that God won't allow them to follow an idol, but they want him out of their daily lives, and so they ask Samuel to ask God to give them a king. Better a king who rules from Jerusalem than a God who lives with them. And God sums up their request this way to Samuel. He says, it's not you that they have rejected, but me as their king. Israel's found that the, the king of glory is a little too hard to follow. They, they want a, a king that they can see and understand that's like all the other nations. And so God's chosen people turn their backs on the special relationship that he offered them alone of all the nations. God, in, in all his mercy and grace, gives them a king, Saul, David, then Solomon. And they become like all the other nations and are led astray. Yet God promises that one day he will once again come to be their king, that justice will rule, that wrong will be put right. A day will come when Messiah enters Jerusalem riding on the colt of a donkey. Those present that first Palm Sunday see it happen. God fulfills his promise, sending his king at last. Over the intervening years, Israel's been conquered and exiled and occupied. And the people want a king, an end to Roman rule. Israel as a sovereign nation again. And, and so the people gladly shout, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. But Matthew says, it was the crowds that went ahead of him and those who followed who shouted Hosanna to the son of David. That those that went ahead and those that followed cried out, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And as is often the case, much of the noise came from those who were out of step with Jesus. Those who had their own plans, those who wanted to use him for their own gains. Noise from the excited People looking for the prospect of a king. But they haven't remembered what following this king means. For those of us trying to follow Jesus in the midst of a pandemic, that's painfully clear. Uh, American megachurch is claiming that God will keep them healthy even if they all come. Liberty University campus being opened up to the students again. Is that faith? Maybe. What about the Tamil Christian prayer meeting that was the super spreader event in Calgary, or choir practice in Washington State that was the source of many deaths. Didn't they have enough faith? You see, following a, a king means listening carefully to him. Our lives depend on it, and so do the lives of others. What's your God calling you to do today? No clue. Other than being faithful. And being faithful to this king can both be exciting and terrifying because his plans for the day usually involve his changing me and my plans. So yeah, Palm Sunday should be a time for loud praise. But Palm Sunday Christianity can trap us into a posture of cheering Jesus from the sidelines, of staying safely with the crowd and cheering him while we actually refuse to follow him as king. Or sometimes we acknowledge him as king, but a king that's no different than other kings. We make him a king in our image and like unto us, a king that we can understand, predict, and control. You see, each of us freely prays the things that we understand. Extroverts get extroverts. Introverts get introverts. And, and this is your day if you're an introvert, but, but maybe being faithful for you is reaching out and phoning or texting your extrovert friends. They're in anguish.
But the, the throng, the throng praised Jesus that first Palm Sunday, the ones before him and following him, because they saw him as a populist leader, a king that would rid them of Rome. And, and they wanted him for their purposes. After all, who wouldn't want a king that could heal all of your diseases, feed your hungry, grant release to the captives, and bring the dead back to life? It sounds like a killer campaign platform for any government looking to be elected now. But Palm Sunday Christianity is when we praise Jesus for our reasons, when we want our homes to survive, when we, we want our jobs to continue, when we want to be freed from isolation, when we want to be healed. That's faith for success, faith so that we sleep well at night, faith of our Father's faith in a, in a paper mache Jesus, a Jesus we think we know, a gentle Jesus, meek and mild, who's understandable and who gives us what we want when we want it. But you know that such a Jesus is simply another idol cast in the shape of a calf. He's a king like the other nations, and that Jesus only exists in our little minds. In C.S. Lewis's Narnia Chronicles, the children are drawn into a make-believe world of talking animals where Aslan the great king reigns. Lucy asks, Is he a man? Aslan a man, said Mrs. Beaver sternly. Certainly not. I tell you that he is king of the wood and son of the great emperor beyond the sea. Don't you know who is the king of beasts? Aslan is a lion, the lion, the great lion. Oh, said Susan, I thought he was a man. Is, is he quite safe? I shall feel rather nervous about meeting a lion. That you will, dearie, and make no mistake, said Mrs. Beaver. If there's anyone who can appear before Aslan without their knees knocking, they're either braver than most or just silly. Then he isn't safe, asked Lucy. Safe, said Mr. Beaver. Don't you hear what Mrs. Beaver tells you? Who said anything about safe? Of course he isn't safe, but he's good. He is the king. Aslan and, and Jesus aren't safe. They're big and scary and they lead us to wonderful places that we wouldn't go to otherwise. They lead us to do wonderful things that we wouldn't think to do otherwise on our own. They, they demand our lives and a complete submission to their kingship, utter abandonment to them and their leading. And so even their followers, the ones that he loves at times, try to keep him at arm's length to stay with the crowd, keep distance from him. We're frightened. And we live in a real world filled with hurts and pains. For every non-Christian that gets laid off, there's going to be a Christian who gets laid off. And for every non-Christian who gets COVID-19 and dies, there's going to be a Christian that gets it and dies. The world isn't fair. It's full of things that we don't understand or like. And in the midst of it all, we long for a God in our image, not a God whose ways are not our ways and whose thoughts are not our thoughts. And when I'm hurting and my loved ones are sick and dying, I don't want to hear Paul speak for God saying, and we know that all things work together for good for them that love him and are called according to his purpose. It's not what I want to hear. I want Jesus to get off that donkey and I want him to heal my friends, my family right now. And I want him to come off the cross and save me. But his ways are not my ways and I don't understand and I hurt sometimes when I don't understand. And I mistakenly think that he doesn't care because he isn't acting the way I want. The way I would. And that's scary. Because then I'm happier to cheer Jesus from the sidelines rather than follow him, rather than be his disciple. I'm, I'm often happier with my Palm Sunday idol, my Palm Sunday king. I, I praise him because he's like me. But my affection, my, my praise, my adoration are hollow unless I follow him for his own sake. Palm Sunday Christianity breaks apart when things get tough. By Thursday, we're impatient for results and we expected so much from this king of our own making. But that imitation Jesus does not have the strength to carry us through the terrors of Thursday evening and Good Friday. And this king in our own image will fail us in real life. And we are in the midst 
of real life. So what can you tell me about your life with Jesus today? What's he been teaching you about living life right now? About your finances, your attitudes, your stewardship, your witness, your compassion and your love. Is he at work in your life or is your life one of your own making? Because if Jesus is king, then he will reign. And if he reigns, he'll touch your life and bring about changes. The crowd was behind him and before him. The disciples walked with him. They'd been changed. They, they knew him. They, they were following. They didn't always understand him. And they certainly got caught up with the crowd and the excitement that day. They thought his kingdom had come that day. But because they were close to him, because they'd known him, and because their chief desire in life was to be with him and serve him, because they followed the real, living, breathing Son of God, the true King of glory, they were able to survive Good Friday, the crucifixion of their king. On Good Friday, all of their plans, all of their hopes and dreams died. Their king, their beloved Jesus, was dead. And their dreams died with them. And then Easter morning came, an empty tomb, a risen Lord, and they knew him. And they, they let him be their true king as they laid aside their Palm Sunday plans and motives. They, they learned that the cross could easily be their destiny. That the king's road did not lead to a palace in Jerusalem. It led to service and compassion and loving the unlovely. And wait, <laughs> did he just look at you? I mean, meaningful eye contact. Yeah, he looked right at you. And he did that little beckoning thing with his hand. And I could almost hear him say, come on, move right in here beside me and follow. You think about that. Amen. Hey, Cornerstone. My name is Joanne, and I am on staff here at Cornerstone. I hope the message Rick just shared was a blessing and encouragement to you and your family. Right now, I just want to share with you a couple of announcements. First, next week is Easter, and although we are extremely disappointed to not be gathering together in person, we want you to know that we still have having both a Good Friday and Easter Sunday service online. Make sure to follow Cornerstone Facebook page for all the details. Secondly, during this time of physical distancing and social isolation, we want to make sure that as a church we are equipping you as families. Each week we are sending out an email to all parents with resources for their children from age 2 all the way up to grade 12. If you haven't been receiving these emails, please let us know and we can fix that. And if you have any suggestions for things to add or ways we can better resource you as families, please let us know. Lastly, though we aren't meeting in person, we want you to still be aware of ways that you can give to Cornerstone. Due to the fact that we aren't able to gather, we would encourage you to give online, and there are three ways that you can do that. First, you can give by e-transfer by emailing donations at cornerstone-church.ca. Second, you can give by credit card or online giving platform Rebel Give, which is found on our website. Or lastly, you can set up pre-authorized debit by downloading and filling out the form found on the giving page of our website. If you would prefer to give by check, you are able to do that as well by mailing them to the office. If you have any questions about any of those options, please contact the office. Now we are going to go into a time of prayer led by Pastor Rick, and we would love for you to join us. So thanks for joining us at uh, Church in a Box yet once again. Good to have you glad that you've been able to share with us and remember if there are things that as a church we can be doing uh, office at cornerstone church.ca let us know uh, we're here to pray for you some of you are using the other platform and we are open for prayer even right now um, but why don't we pray together would you bow with me Lord our God we come and we're grateful that you uh, have created a family that spans not only this community, but Lord, the world itself. Our prayer is that in these days you would be uniting brothers and sisters together, that we would be showing your presence in the world by loving one another, and that as we do that well, Lord, that we would have compassion, generosity, and capacity to love those around us. 
Our prayer, Jesus, is, is really a simple one. Be with us. Our desire is to walk with you. Not to stay along the sidelines, but to, to enter each day with an awareness of your presence and a desire to follow you where you guide and where you call us. Help us to keep our eyes on you. Help us to keep our, our ears open to you. Help us to, to find time in, in these moments uh, for prayer, for quiet, for reflection on your word. Lord, these are all disciplines that the church has practiced for years and years and years, and we want to make them our own again in these days. And we pray, Father, that you would not only be using us now, but that you would be creating in us a, an awareness and a desire to figure out how the church meets the needs of a society around us, not just in pandemic, but in the world that will follow this. And we thank you that we don't walk this journey alone, but that you walk with us. Send us forth now into this day, into the week ahead, Passion Week for you, as we recall your death, your crucifixion, and Lord God, on Easter Sunday morning, your resurrection. Create in us life, your life, we pray, that the glory would be yours in Jesus' name. Amen. Go in peace.